Thank you, panel two. We want to proceed until the other members get back. Uh, the panelists are uh, William Dugan, the National President of the National Federation of Federal Employees, a role which he assumed in 2009. Uh, Mr. Dugan began his federal career in, in 1976 with the National Park Service as a firefighter and tree planter. He is a 30-year member of the National Federation of Federal Employees and has served in a variety of positions at local council and national levels. Uh, Colleen Kelly is the president of the National uh, Treasury Employees Union, which is the nation's largest independent federal sector union and represents employees in 31 different government agencies. Ms. Kelly was first elected to the union's top post in August of 2009. Philip Glover has served as the national legislative director for the Council of Prison Locals of the American Federation of Government Employees since 2005. Mr. Glover is also a senior officer, a senior office specialist for the Bureau of Prisons in Loretto, Pennsylvania, where he has served for 20 years. Prior to his time at the Bureau of Prisons, Mr. Glover served in the United States Army. Uh, Patricia Part Bartz worked for the Internal Revenue Service for over 30 years, where she served as a lead examiner in the IRS's Correspondence Examination Group. Since retiring from the IRS, Ms. Bott now serves as a vocal member of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. Welcome, uh, panel two, and we begin with Mr. Dugan. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to swear in swear in the panel uh, do you pledge to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth let the record show that all the witnesses have replied in the affirmative okay. now mr. Dugan miss Norton on behalf of the National Federation of Federal Employees, NFFE, and the 110,000 federal employees that we represent, I thank the subcommittee for holding this hearing. This critical issue has gone unaddressed since 1994 when James Hudson, a veteran and U.S. Park Service employee, died at the Lincoln Memorial, leaving his widow and seven children destitute. He had no life insurance because of his temporary status. After legislation was introduced to remedy this, Hudson's widow com commented, something good has come out of the death of my husband. This legislation means no one else will have to go through what this family went through. The bill subsequently died in committee. Since then, we have seen MSPB's 1994 prediction come true that continued use of long-term temporary employment has created a permanent underclass in the federal workforce. How long does temporary last in the federal government? For some employees of the U.S. Forest Service, temporary has lasted more than 30 years. We all would like to think that the federal government is a model employer as well it should be, but thousands of employees hired into temporary positions receive no health insurance benefits, no life insurance benefits, no retirement benefits, no step increases, and no competitive standing for internal placement into career jobs. Federal land management agencies in particular overuse temporary employment. Even though land management work occurs every year, a loophole in the regulations allows agencies to use an unlimited number of successive temporary appointments. Some agencies are using this loophole to the maximum extent. Roughly 35 to 40 percent of the workforces of the Forest Service and National Park Service are hired as temps each season. I brought with me today Joe Katz of Dover, Idaho, who's sitting here. Joe has worked as a temporary employee of the Forest Service almost every year since 1975. However, he remains a temporary worker to this day. He has been hired and terminated each year under a string of temporary appointments. Joe is a Marine who served his country honorably in Vietnam. He has held his current position in trails and recreation for 21 of the past 22 seasons yet he still has no career position. I've also brought Lisa McKinney of High and Palm, California, who's sitting there. She began working for the Forest Service as a firefighter in 1978 and has worked for the agency almost every season since then. 
She has performed the same regular and recurring work as a certified timber cruiser since 1995, yet she too has never received a career position. Joe and Lisa exemplify the boots on the ground that actually get the agency's work done. Temporary employees like Joe and Lisa make invaluable contributions to the mission of the Forest Service. Many work for years, even decades, and never get a career seasonal appointment. Thousands of long-term temps work for five or more seasons. This is simply outrageous. Long-term temps are only part of the story. Most temps move on to other employment within a few years, taking their experience and training with them. Because they are misclassified as temps, this huge retention problem goes unnoticed and unaddressed. With high turnover, safety suffers. Recently, a long-term temporary employee who serves on a fire crew told me that eight of the members on her 11-person crew were rookies. I can tell you from my personal experience as a firefighter, that is a recipe for disaster. This is a tough problem. There's no way under current laws and regulations to redesignate jobs held for decades by long-term temps as the permanent seasonal career jobs they really are. A career job with exactly the same duties as the long-term temporary job is considered a new job. And as MSPB noted in 1994, legal and procedural barriers prevent the consideration of many temporary employees for career positions regardless of how well they have performed. To avoid a purge, a pathway to permanence for long-term temps must be the first step in reform. It would be unjust and unwise to discard these dedicated public servants and their knowledge and experience after their many years of service. If I only get one point across at this hearing, I hope it will be this. To make clear to this subcommittee and federal agencies that a pathway to permanence must be put in place before reform can begin. In closing, we would propose enactment of legislation to grant competitive standing to long-term temporary employees so they can compete for any career job, just like other federal employees may do. Afford priority consideration to any long-term temporary employee whose job is converted to career status. And give long-term temporary employees creditable service time for their temporary service for certain purposes. This proposal has no price tag. It has no mandate. It is consistent with the 1994 recommendation of OPM and the National Partnership Council. It would simply provide agencies with the tools to allow reform to begin. With this done, NEFI will commit to working with the agencies, OPM, MSPB, and Congress on the appropriate use of available employment authorities. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dugan. Um, Ms. Kelly. Thank you very much, Chairman Norton. On behalf of the 160,000 federal employees represented by NTEU, I want to thank you for this hearing today to talk about the important issue, uh, the use of temporary employees by the government. As you've heard, there are too many stories out there, uh, very real stories that are happening today. And while temporary employment status we all recognize can be useful to an agency when it is properly applied, it is also a status that lends itself to abuse, and it can be an unfair working condition for an employee. Temporary employees do not participate in FERS or in the right to family and medical leave or in leave for military service. And these policies must be might be defensible for a true temporary employee of one year or less, but it becomes a severe denial of rights when the status is abused. Regulations are very clear that agencies are prohibited from using temporary status to avoid the costs of employee benefits, to extend the probationary period, or to avoid competitive hiring. However, we are concerned that these regulations are too often ignored. Today I would like to highlight a uh, particularly unfair situation that confronts current and former employees of the FDIC who performed temporary service early in their careers. But this issue I'm going to describe would impact every temporary employee who is currently under that status today. The FDIC hired thousands of temporary employees during the 1980s, and they were known as LG employees, or liquidation grade employees. Their duties included managing and liquidating the assets of failed banks and savings and loans. However, they were excluded from any credit for retirement under FERS. They continued to serve in one-year appointments 
with thousands of them serving longer than five years and many renewed for over 15 years in those appointments. These employees were clearly temporary only in name. The FDIC hired them under special authority it had acquired in 1938 and had never surrendered that authority. However, that authority had only been used to hire temporary bank-specific teams of liquidation personnel. In the early 1980s, the FDIC adopted a new policy of establishing regional offices dealing with multiple bank liquidations. It is this action that NTU considered an abuse, as such work had historically been viewed as permanent. In 1993, OPM moved to take away this authority from the FDIC. Over the objections of employees and NTEU, OPM agreed to a compromise with the FDIC that allowed them to phase it out in uh, their misuse of this temporary classification and phase it out over two and a half years, from January 94 to June of 96, continuing the denial of retirement credit during that time. With the passage of the FERS Act in 1986, federal employees without retirement credit, because they had years as temporary employees, were able to buy back credit for the years prior to 1989 by paying for the retirement deductions that were not taken. But former LG employees were not allowed to buy back their credit for temporary service after 1989. The result is that valuable service time from January 189 until the date they actually became eligible to participate in FERS and have made deductions was essentially lost or forfeited. Now, we understand that the intent of Congress in the 1986 FERS legislation was to encourage agencies to cease overusing temporary employees and abusing the classification. Congress allowed a two-year window as agencies transitioned, but it was not expected that the FDIC, a government corporation with considerable administrative autonomy, would continue to abuse the temporary service early in their careers. The FDIC, <coughs> excuse me, the um, NTU had long argued that Congress needed to act to correct this grave injustice that was suffered by LG employees. NTEU, along with many members of Congress and FDIC management, have voiced support for legislation to allow LG employees to buy back their missed retirement credit. We would ask that Congress move to allow former FDIC LG employees to get credit for years of service they performed between 89 and when they were given permanent status, so long as they are willing to make a payment for these years of credit equal to the retirement deductions they would have contributed if they had been allowed. We propose this credit would only be available to those who were victims of the unfair FDIC policy. We are not asking that it be extended to those who never accepted or acquired permanent federal positions. We believe that allowing these misclassified LG employees the opportunity to buy back their lost retirement credit would be an equitable and just resolution to the unfairness that they faced by being misclassified for so many years as temporary workers. In a few days, we expect the President will be signing the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. And I would like to thank you, Chairman Lynch, for your efforts on that bill, especially in crafting the aspects dealing with federal personnel policies. This groundbreaking consumer protection legislation is witness to the importance of the work of the frontline employees at the FDIC and other financial regulatory agencies. I don't think it is too much to ask that those men and women who are working so hard as bank examiners, liquidation specialists, and credit union consumer compliance specialists be given retirement credit for all of their years of service in the federal government. Thank you again for this hearing, and I would welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. President Kelly. Mr. Glover, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Lynch, Congresswoman Norton, uh, members of the subcommittee. My name is Phil Glover. I am the National Legislative Coordinator for the Council of Prison Locals, American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 28,000 correctional workers nationwide serving in 114 federal prisons. I have served as a representative of the union since 1991 and have been involved in many representational and legislative issues throughout my service. Uh, this issue was brought to us by members at our local who, uh, as they started to look at retirement, this service credit issue arose. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today at the hearing on existing temporary employee authorities and their adverse impact on temporary employee status and benefits. Our problem at Bureau of Prisons 
is the fact that many federal correctional workers who are participants in the federal employees retirement system are unable to make a service credit deposit into FERS for temporary civilian service performed after January 1, 1989. Federal correctional workers as well as, well as other federal law enforcement officers are covered by special retirement rules. Under 5 CFR Section 842-208, an employee working in law enforcement can retire after 25 years of service at any age and at 50 years of age after 20 years of federal service. We have mandatory retirement at age 57. It has been determined that working with violent offenders requires a youthful and vigorous workforce. This has been in effect for correctional officers and federal correctional workers since 1956. The mandatory retirement age was changed in 1990 from 55 to 57 years of age. Our members perform dangerous work inside federal BOP correctional institutions. We supervise murderers, gang members, terrorists, and other dangerous inmates. Since the brutal stabbing murder of a correctional officer in June of 2008 by two prison inmates at USP Atwater, we have had at least 380 vicious inmate on worker assaults in the BOP system. After 20 to 25 years working in these facilities under such stressful conditions, most people are ready to leave. Once our employees attain their retirement age, it is normal, depending on their individual circumstances, to retire. This is where the problem arises regarding service credit for temporary civilian service. 5 CFR Section 304 and 305 do not allow a deposit for temporary civilian service after January 1, 1989. Many bargaining unit employees in the BOP have been hired using temporary employment rules. This is done for many reasons, such as to get a specialist on board quickly or to hire large groups of correctional officers to start up an existing prison, a new facility. Between 1989 and 1991, the BOP went on a large hiring spree due to identified understaffing problems in the systems. As many as 6,000 employees were hired and many of them were hired as temporary employees. Records from the Department of Justice indicate that between 1989 and 1993, there were 3,569 employees initially hired by the Bureau of Prisons as temporary employees, and then after short periods of time, were transitioned into permanent employee status. Similarly, DOJ and the National Finance Center records show that between 89 and 2010, there were over 6,200 employees initially hired by BOP as temporary employees and then again, after short periods of time, were transitioned into permanent employee status. Many of those BOP employees are now approaching retirement age. Many of them didn't realize they were hired in temporary employment status. We had a situation recently where one employee was hired before the January 1, 1989 date and thus could make a deposit for service credit, while another employee hired one month later was informed he could not. This is clearly unfair. Another situation that confuses the issue is the employee service date for seniority purposes is the date they began receiving paychecks in BOP. However, their retirement date could be a year to three years later depending on the date they gained permanent employment status. It is also unclear why this regulation was changed in the first place. In the change from the Civil Service Retirement System to FERS, which passed in 1986, the ability to make a deposit for service credit was maintained. It wasn't until 1989 that credible service was denied to employees who were willing to make the deposit. We have identified employees who have as much as three years temporary employment time in the Bureau of Prisons. These employees have worked alongside full-time employees who can retire at the appropriate age and time and service requirements. The employee with temporary service time is used in the same manner as those with full-time service. They respond to emergencies, they handle difficult inmates, and may have been on the voluntary disturbance control team or other emergency operations. They must pass a full 15-year background check, pass basic correctional training in Glencoe, Georgia, and handle a firearm. Temporary employees in the BOP also have arrest authority pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 3050. If Congress would change the provision back to the 1988 language, we believe it should include all current, current employees. In closing, all law enforcement officers, including BOP correctional workers, should be able to make the service credit deposit into FERS for temporary civilian service performed after January 1, 1989. And I'll be happy to answer any questions I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Glover. Ms. Bartsch, you now recognize for an opening statement for five minutes. Chairman, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee, my name is Patricia Bartz. I am from ATCO, New Jersey, and I appreciate the opportunity 
to testify on behalf of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association about my experiences as a seasonal status federal worker. I was employed with the Internal Revenue Service at the Philadelphia Service Center from January 1970, retiring on July 31, 2001. From 1970 until 1986, I was a seasonal employee. In November of 60, 1969, I took the civil service test for federal employment. Shortly after, I was called to take an 80-hour unpaid training course as a data transcriber. In early January of 1970, I was hired to work transcribing tax returns as a seasonal worker. I worked from January to June that first year. When I was called back the next filing season, I worked a similar period and additional months to work on the quarterly returns. Eventually, I was working 10 months each year. One of those years, during my 14 seasonal years as a data transcriber, I worked every day except one, being furloughed on a Thursday and brought back on a Monday. This was done to break my time. If I had worked the extra day, I would have been, been made a permanent employee and entitled to all the rights and benefits that would accrue to that status. During my time in data transcription, I was promoted to a lead data transcriber. My duties included instructing other employees and filling in for the supervisor. I enjoyed my work and only left the department because I could not become a permanent employee and advance to a higher grade. In 1984, I was accepted as a seasonal tax examiner in the correspondence audit department. I took this position because it offered a higher grade and a chance to become a permanent employee. After about a year and a half, I became an imper a permanent worker. During my career in the examination department, I was selected to be a lead tax examiner and instructor. My duties in this department, including handling problem cases and telephone calls for other tax examiners, acting as a supervisor when the supervisor was not in the office, and holding yearly update classes in tax law changes each October. When the Federal Employees Retirement System was introduced to the Federal Employees in January of 1987, the employees like me, who were in the older Civil Service Retirement System, were counseled to remain in SERS. This turned out to be bad advice. At this time, the seasonal employees in FERS were credited with a full year's service time if they worked at least four months out of the year. The SERS employees contacted our bargaining unit, the National Treasury Employees Union, about receiving the same credit for their years of service before FERS was implemented. This request was denied by IRS management at the service center. Their decision not only affected our years of service, it also affected our time and grade for step raises in the general schedule pay series. The FERS employees were receiving a full year service credit to their time and grade and years of service for retirement. It is my feeling that we should have been credited with our service the same as the FERS employees. If this had been the policy, I would have 31 years and seven months of service instead of 26 years and seven months. This policy greatly affected my retirement annuity and that of the other fellow SERS workers. I enjoyed working for the agency and always felt respected by my supervisors. Still as a matter of equity, I believe I have been unfairly denied benefits which I should have been able to access. I understand the subcommittee is interested in reviewing a proposal that would allow temporary employees who have extended years of service to qualify for permanent job status, as well as a plan to allow such workers to credit their temporary status towards retirement. NARF welcomes this discussion and we would like to participate in the development of these reasonable proposals. Mr. Chairman, thank you for focusing attention on temporary and seasonal hiring authorities and on how such service affects our status and benefit offerings. <clears throat> Excuse me. I appreciate your allowing me to testify today on behalf of myself and other active and retired employees who work part of their public service careers as seasonal or temporary workers. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I now yield myself uh, five minutes.
thank you each for your willingness to come before the committee and, and testify and to help us with our work. Uh, there are several different uh, points at which temporary employees are uh, treated m far less favorably uh, in the federal system, uh, especially recognizing in that many instances they are uh, continuously temporarily employed year after year and uh, it, it seems that the the underlying basis of, of treating them dis differently uh, is is undermined by this continual employment one of the, one of the things that I, I think is uh, fundamentally unfair here is that in our scheme of uh, uh, our scheme of preference, uh, we've established a preference for veterans that I think is noble and right. Uh, we've established a preference in some jobs uh, for uh, prior service, uh, the Peace Corps, I think we talked about earlier with the uh, folks from the uh, uh, National Forest Service. But unless I'm missing something, there is no preference for a per person who has done that job uh, as a temporary worker in becoming a career employee. In other words, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that they are treated basically the same as a person who comes off the street. So they're not getting any advantage. They're, they're, they're coming into the process as if they had never worked in their, their current job. And I think that is wrong. And I think there's got to be some way to, to acknowledge the, albeit temporary service, for that employee so that they aren't at the very back of the line, that they get some recognition and some type of preference in terms of filling those career positions. I know that, uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Simpson who testified on the first panel that said that, uh, you know, uh, roughly 40%, I think, of uh, his eventual career employees uh, were chosen from the were, were chosen from the temporary workforce. However, uh, when they were chosen, they were not given any greater advantage than someone just walking in off the street. And uh, is is that a problem that you see in terms of uh, you know? recognizing the status. I know it doesn't, it doesn't address the point that you mentioned, Ms. Bartz, about crediting, uh, crediting temporary time towards your pension, but it might get you in the door faster so that the, you know, so that the, uh, the ability of a temporary employee might to, to get into a, uh, a career position uh, where they're earning pension credits is is sooner than than what otherwise might be. Are there other are there other uh, solutions that you can see that would eliminate the the difficulty that we're experiencing with these temporary employees? Ms. Kelly, uh, Chairman Lynch, I would say to, uh, to your specific question. That is something that um, would help, whether, uh, and you could define it a number of ways, even if you just started by giving them first consideration so that they had to, you know, they were on the short list at least to be considered. Today, they have to literally apply through the outside process as if they never worked for the government. And uh, we went through this um, very recently up in your part of the country with the Andover Service Center. Right. Um, you know, the in that case, I would say the IRS had appropriately used some temporary hiring authority as they were ramping down the submission processing operation. But then when um, new work was added to Andover and new positions were added, permanent positions were added, all of those temporary workers, many of whom had been there for four years, had no first consideration rights uh, to even be considered for those permanent jobs. So something like you described would be um, a, a giant step forward to fix that part of the problem. I would suggest, though, that um, another part of the problem, just from things I've heard here today and from some situations that we've seen at NTU, is the question to the agencies of how many of these temporary employees or temporary positions 
are really temporary positions. I mean, I don't know how you justify um, in, in the FDIC when we had employees hired year after year for 15 years, or how, and, and uh, Mr. Dugan could speak um, better to this than I on, on you know, those uh, who have joined him today. I mean, if people are doing the same job year after year, even if it's only for six months, then that is, in my view, a permanent seasonal position. It is still seasonal. It's not a full time. It doesn't create work where it doesn't exist. But it's a permanent seasonal position, not a temporary seasonal position. And that would that alone would change the status of those employees and their eligibility to retirement and contributions for health insurance and to FMLA and to all of the um, you know all of the rights and benefits that um, permanent a uh, permanent career workforce has in the federal government. So I think that that's as big a piece as. Uh, figuring out how to be able to get them first consideration or some priority is to, um, you know, really press hard on these agencies as to how they're designating these positions. Uh, it just, uh, is there some, are there some that should be temporary? Probably. But the numbers that I heard today and the real life examples that I've heard, that it just doesn't sound right to me. Thank you. I notice my time has expired. I now yield five minutes to Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, the Congresswoman from District of Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I guess I can understand, for example, that in, in the IRS, Ms. Barris, <laughs> when the, you might have temporary, because of the tax season and the way that goes. Um, but I must say, uh, with Ms. Kelly, I wonder about the use of temporary employees across the whole spectrum. Of the, of the federal government, uh, and whether there's been the kind of oversight to assure us that there is not abuse. Uh, uh, Miss, um, is it Bartz? Bartz, yes. Yeah, Miss Bartz, Patricia Bartz. Um, I was drawn to the part of your testimony on on page one where not only did they break your time in order to keep you from the uh, uh, keep you in the seasonal Permanent status, status. Yeah. Uh, but somehow they managed to promote you and I didn't quite understand that during my time at data transcription I was promoted to lead data uh, transcriber you had supervisory duties um, well others working under you also Temporary employees? They were all seasonals, yes. They the only had two, uh, the supervisor was the permanent employee, and she had a, uh, what we call, the timekeeper was a, for the groups were was a permanent employee. Everybody else was a seasonal employee. Now, you say on the next page that after about a year and a half, you became a permanent worker. Once I was picked up by a correspondence audit, yes. Uh, Once you were picked up by whom? The other department, correspondence uh, examination department. So you got on that permanent registry or that permanent list, list for that job? Uh, I applied. I applied for several jobs when I was in data over the 14-year period, but and I was accepted for quite a few of them. But they always the department always said that they couldn't release me at that time, and that eliminated that job opportunity for me. The department wanted to maintain you right. for, their, for their own purposes. Right, and they, that, they could do I that. always applied could, for the permanent job. They could do that even though you had a, an offer for a permanent job? Yes. Boy, that sounds, that sounds something close to slavery here. Uh, that's, would, that's the way it was done back in the, in the 70s. That's, did your work um, as a seasonal employee help you uh, in the process of applying for the permanent job? Uh, my evaluations that I received over the years was a, a great uh, a help to uh, be picked up for the other department. And um, I was on a roster, yes, for a permanent job. I was on a roster for a permanent job. But as I said, as the permanent jobs would come up and we, not just myself, other people would apply, if it was in the height of their filing season, they would not let you go. I think that's that's really quite scandalous, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, the The chairman asked about um, uh, whether or not such an employee, essentially in in competition, 
um, was like anybody else coming off the street, it's rather counterintuitive to believe that I'm got myself on a roster for a job like Ms. Bart's and I'm able to show that I was on precisely the same job. It's hard to believe that that wouldn't help me in some way in the competition with others who may have indeed been doing similar work but not been doing it in the agency. So it, it, it uh, and perhaps it's, it's just counterintuitive to me to, to think that, they, that that person who's been doing that work in, in, in a federal agency is precisely the same as somebody who may have been doing something in the private sector or have other kinds of, of, um, of credentials. Don't you think it's helpful at least uh, that that person has been doing work of a very similar nature in the, in the federal sector when the application for, and once you, once you are applying for a permanent job? I, I would sure hope so, that if the applications were looked at that closely. Well, um, perhaps we ought to say so. We so but, perhaps we ought to say so when these, these ex employees are applying. Exactly. If there were some kind of a process that said, first consideration is given to those employees who are doing this work for this federal agency in a temporary status. Well, it doesn't so, even say consideration should be given, does it? No, no, my words of first consideration would be a giant step forward from where we are today. And I'm only using that as an example for those who would oppose some kind of a guaranteed selection, you know, to just think, you know, kind of try to think of a process that would at least, um, you know, give that first consideration. I think that there's, there, there's a couple of things here. Really, there's, there's, there's a question of what hiring process is being used, because the agency is certainly free to um, use their internal hiring process which under the current regulations, a temporary employee is not even eligible to apply under the internal process. So um, that avenue is, they are excluded from from the get-go. Um, so they, they only have the um, external hiring process that the rest of the public um, has available to them. So they're competing with, with everybody else out on the street um, for those positions. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that, that certainly their experience working as a temporary um, in an agency um, that they're applying for a permanent position in, um, it certainly doesn't hurt them, but it certainly is true that it, that it does not give them um, necessarily a leg up on, uh, on, on any other uh, uh, person of, uh, that, that, that is applying for that job. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things we can do. I think one, we could, um, um, if, if we grant competitive standing to our long-term temporary workforce, they'll have the ability not only to apply through the external hiring process, but also through the merit, merit systems hiring process internally of the agency. So um, they'll, they'll, ha they'll get a fair shake just like the rest of, of the uh, permanent workforce in terms of applying for uh, permanent jobs in that agency and doing that. And I think the other thing um, that, that, we, that we could do would be, as, as you've described and as Colleen um, has talked about, is, is, is afford some sort of priority consideration to long-term temporary employees, particularly if the agency decides to um, make their current temporary position a permanent position. Um, it's my belief that if we have an employee that's been in, a, in, a, in a, a series of positions doing the same job five, six, seven years, 10 years, 30 years, essentially th those, those people are incumbents in those positions. And the fact of the matter is that the position was misclassified by the agency as a temporary position when in fact, when you look at the recurring nature of the work, it's really, it's really a permanent position for, uh, uh, in reality. And so, it's my belief that, that those folks need to be given priority consideration for those positions for which they've been doing the work all along once those positions are, uh, uh, are made permanent positions by the agency. Mr. Chairman, uh, I see my time is up. I, I was very concerned. I do not believe it was this roster of witnesses who testified about firefighters. And we know there are parts of the country where these firefighters are absolutely essential. You can understand the seasonal nature of the work. But here, experience can be life-saving. 
And it does seem to me we've got to look at various categories of work here as well. I'm not sure. I think the testimony was that, you know, eight out of ten was, was a rookie. Was that you, Mr. Dugan? The eight out of ten yes, of these firefighters each year is a, is a rookie, which means that you've got to, for one of the most dangerous jobs in America, indeed it is uh, considered the most dangerous and usual, usually in civil service work, you've got a whole bunch of people who are new, people have reached their two-year two limit, and there you go retraining or training people for one of the most, uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, risky jobs in the workforce. Mr. Dugan, uh, would you like to elaborate on that uh, testimony? Because it does seem to me it, it, it requires some kind of priority attention from the subcommittee. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the situation with wildland firefighting uh, workforce in the federal government, there's relatively few federal agencies that, that have employees that have that expertise. There's the Forest Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Those are the five federal agencies that primarily have a wildland firefighting workforce. These people are specially trained. Uh, the, the agencies have invested a lot of time and resources and money in terms of training these people. Uh, they have highly specialized uh, uh, training. They hold uh, a variety of qualifications. It takes many years of training and experience out on these fires um, for people to work their way up into leadership positions in, in the fire organization. And it is not uncommon um, to see on wildland, fire, on, on wildland fires temporary employees that are part of a fire crew um, that actually have more experience um, than um, the leaders of those crew, or in many cases, some of the other leaders that are, that are in charge of and responsible for uh, managing these wildfires. Um, and to me, I mean, the, the risk that we run um, as a country and, and, in, these, and in these agencies, um, if, we, if, if we fail to acknowledge the professional work the experience and the skills that these folks have and don't make an, an honest effort to retain these and we just let these people go, um, uh, uh, we really risk having a, a brain drain um, in, in, in the area of wildland firefighting which, as, as Ms. Norton pointed out, um, has uh, some, some potential uh, catastrophic safety implications if we have inexperienced people out there um, trying to lead and uh, lead these crews as well as uh, put these fires out. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Dugan, if I could just stay on that issue for a minute. Uh, what do we see right now in terms of the uh, wildfire uh, firefighters? Uh, is, are you seeing, you know, professional firefighters, city firefighters, volunteer firefighters that, that go into that line of work, or is it just a, is it across the board from every walk of life? Um, the, the current workforce of, of, of the federal government's wild, wildland firefighting um, uh, uh, workforce, there's, there's really two pieces to it. One is a, we have, uh, most of these agencies or all of these agencies have um, essentially permanent, they do have some permanent permanent seasonal positions um, in their fire organizations. These folks work um, seasonally, but they're permanent employees. They typically work uh, six to nine months out of the year. Um, um, but the bulk of the firefighting workforce that's hired in the federal government are temporary employees. And where, where the federal government gets their temporary um, wildland firefighting workforce is really from, uh, really from uh, a couple of different areas. One is, um, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, college students that, that apply for these jobs. Um, they're looking to make a lot of money. Uh, these guys work a lot of hours and they, they tend to get a lot of overtime. So it's a good way for college students that are, you know, um, out of school to earn some money to, uh, to help them out to pay their tuition and books. Um, the, the second uh, function or, or, or group of folks that, that um, tend to be drawn into these kinds of of uh, positions as um, uh, just, you know, average people out on the street. Um, the Forest Service um, 
for the most part, has a, has a presence in more rural communities across America, uh, particularly out in the, in the western U.S. Um, these jobs, these firefighting jobs, are um, highly coveted by uh, uh, people that live in small towns. Uh, the Forest Service is often the largest employer uh, in the town and also pays probably, uh, for the most part, the highest wage. So these jobs are are really sought after by local residents in these in these rural communities and and really have um, a huge impact on those local economies um, but but what we see with these temporary jobs is you know if if these folks are, are are expected to be hired year after year as a temporary not afforded any benefits not afforded retirement not afforded health care what we see in terms of retaining this workforce is after a certain amount of time, these folks leave and are wooed away by um, county fire departments, um, by city fire departments, by state forestry organizations who can often pay more than the federal government and offer these folks um, permanent jobs and better wages. So we're losing a lot of our wildland firefighting workforce um, through because of those reasons, particularly out in California. We see that quite a bit. Mm. Uh let me, let me ask, and, and maybe, uh, Ms. Kelly, I, I explored this with the first panel, uh, trying to figure out uh, where the practices of uh, prudent and optimum management uh, separate from abuse. Uh, you know, we in Congress, uh, uh, we hire young interns uh, on a regular basis, and, and, you know, when we see one or two that might be especially bright, we snap them up. But generally it's understood uh, that uh, there aren't a lot of opportunities, so that's a rare occasion. And, but since they're only there for uh, a learning experience and uh, uh, there's no expectation of hiring, I suppose it's fair. We, we never get, we very, very, very rarely get interns back twice. Uh, but here, um, here you've got this repeat uh, year after year, decades long uh, relationship where workers keep coming back and, and uh, some of them might be stuck. Some of them just love their jobs, but some of them are relying on that on, as, as, as anybody else would over time. Uh, and, and I'm just trying to find a way to, to determine when that, uh, you know, repeat uh, employment becomes abuse, and how do how do we get at that, uh, Mr. Dugan? You've described you know a situation. Uh, Ms. Bartz, you've you've described another. Uh, Mr. Glover as well with with the Bureau of Prisons, uh, and, and President Kelly. How do I how do I devise a solution that's going to be able to sort of capture all those different situations and and provide some type of uh, you know you want to have some flexibility for management to bring in temporary employees when needed, but this type of abuse, you know, where people are, uh, are in there for decades or, or, you know, eight or ten years brought back and, and uh, a denied retirement, they're denied annuity, they're denied health care benefits. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's the way that the federal government should be operating as an employer. And so, you know, I, I think some of our federal management agencies are are adopting this strategy as a way of balancing their budgets. And they're doing it on the backs of these temporary employees, and that's as simple as that. And we're allowing it to happen. And we've got to figure out some way to, you know, to, uh, to push back, to say, okay, you know, this person's coming back for the fourth consecutive year. Uh, you know, if they come back for the fifth, they're going to have to earn something. Uh, or there needs to be some pathways to career employment made for these people where, you know, as you say, when a position becomes permanent, it goes from temporary to permanent, I think the assumption should be or uh, the, uh, the priority should be to hire the people who are in that job and doing that job uh, originally when it changes over. But there's also got to be some way of of uh, not necessarily dis not displacing a veteran going for a job, but but next in line, uh, so to speak, there should be an opportunity to put.
these temporary workers in line right behind them ahead of the general public. And I'm just trying to figure out a way to, uh, to develop a system that would accommodate those realities. Well, I, again, Chairman Lynch, I think there's a couple. Um, I would probably take it in a couple of different directions. And we would be glad, NT would be glad to work with the committee. I'm sure we all would on, you know, language to fit like kind of each or to fix each of these problems. The, it, when I was getting ready for this hearing, um, I, I was focused on the IRS and the FDIC because the IRS hires a lot of seasonal employees. Um, I did not come in here intending to say that I think the IRS is doing a great job, but I have to tell you, after listening to everything I heard today, they are doing a great job. Um, they really, I don't know what happened back in, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, you know, in Ms. Bartz's situation, and, uh, and I'm sure those facts, you know, drive, um, you know, why she's here today. I can tell you that today, the IRS um, employs tens of thousands of seasonals, and most of them are permanent seasonals with all the rights that go along with permanent employment, even though their schedule might only be a four or six or nine month a year job. Um, it's the seasonal is def defines their schedule, not what benefits that they have. Um, and as I said, they, they don't always hire it as permanent, but I think over the years, NTU has helped them perhaps see you know, um, the criteria that should be used so that when they were doing the ramp downs um, of submission processing, they used that. Um, but I, even though today the, um, the IRS is, seems to be doing it at least as well, if not better than most agencies, um, I think what you've also heard here today are a lot of, is a lot of harm that has been done in the past that we're hoping we could um, have Congress help us to give employees who have been harmed by not being able to redeposit their FERS, the uh, FDIC employees who got no credit for up to 15 years of work and now are federal employees but don't have credit for that 15 years. Um, so I think one piece of it is if we could figure out how to um, give them an opportunity to buy those years back. Yeah. And then, of course, to make sure, to your point, that it uh, is happening correctly. Um, and maybe I was the only one who heard this um, or heard it this way on the first panel. I was a little surprised to hear OPM say that um, if you, you're going to work six months or more, then you're a permanent seasonal. If you're going to work six months or less, it's up to the agency to decide whether you're a temporary seasonal or a permanent seasonal. And that they grant these waivers that I think that they were questioned about these waivers. I don't know how closely anybody's looking at those waivers, but it seems to me that they, if they ask for it, they get it. And that's where I would like to see the agencies push pretty hard and held to a standard, as you're suggesting, um, that, you know, that they, they should be able to make a case that 40 percent of the workforce is really temporary. I mean, if, right. if they need employees in those jobs, in those parks, uh, for six months a year or four months a year or seven months a year, they need them every year. I think that's a permanent seasonal job. It's not temporary. Right. And, but nobody seems to be, there doesn't seem to be a process to hold them accountable for that designation. Mr. Glover, if I could ask you about this uh, opportunity to, to buy back time. Uh, obviously, we, you know, we are facing extreme uh, limitations on the federal budget. And uh, we've got a massive deficit. Uh, you know, I think rightly Congress is, is sharpening its pencils and looking at every expenditure that we make. Uh, however, I think there's a certain fairness that you bring out in your argument for those employees who, uh, you know, because of the seemingly arbitrary application of a regulation against them, they've been taken out of a position that they originally were, uh, you know, they had benefits in. How, how would you envision uh, giving an opportunity to the Bureau of Prisons folks that uh, I guess they were in the system in, in back in 89 and then and then now they denied that opportunity. H how do we reconcile that for the employees that you represent? I think what happened, Mr. Chairman, is the way when the regulation changed from the, 90, the, the 1988 when you could buy back into your service credit, we had employees being hired at that time in large numbers, so some were hired under the 88 rule, some were hired under the 89 rule. And so what happened is if you were hired after 1 January 89, 
you could not buy back your service you could not buy back in for the service credit so we have employees actually one that was able to buy back six months of temporary service and one one month later that wasn't allowed to buy back six months of temporary service and so that person has to work inside the federal prison for another six months prior to his retirement and at that point in your career after after working in the system uh, for 20 to 25 years you're tired um, and you're ready to go generally what I want want to at least add is is as part of this discussion is that time should count if you're a temporary, you're hired temporary, and the Bureau of Prisons, uh, the way the Bureau of Prisons does it, they identify you as an employee that they want. Uh, for instance, Fort Devens. When Fort Devens in Massachusetts was converted from a military base to a federal prison hospital, uh, they were trying to get employees on board quickly to get that prison up. So you might hire 60 to 100 employees as a temporary in a temporary status because they've already identified they want that employee. They've already had an interview. They're waiting on paperwork. They're waiting on a background check. And they, they want to get them on board. The, the thing is, though, is you're in there working in the same circumstances as every full-term employee. You, you don't have any different rule, work rules as far as responding to an emergency, uh, handling a disruptive inmate, handling some of the situations that we handle on a daily basis. And so what our argument is, is once they make you permanent, you should be able to step back and re, uh, re-credit that service, the service that they have from when they started, because they've been made permanent. And they should at least get to reach back and say, this time should count. And I'll, I'll redeposit. I mean, we're not talking about the government Necessarily, we're talking about the employee being able to redeposit for their right. service credit. Right. So that's the piece that we're particularly interested because all the FERS employees now are hitting their 20 year marks, obviously. And now they're starting to realize what they did. Right. And, and it's now incumbent upon the union that represents them to go out and do something about it. Right. And while there's still time, maybe for those last five years, that they make those contributions that they would have made uh, so that they're actually buying their, they're making, making bad years into good years in creditable service. Correct. Okay. We've got to figure out that balance because there is not a, le- a lot of extra resources out there. And, and so, if, you know. if I could also say this, in a scoring of this, you would have numerous employees who may get back some of this temporary time and actually retire. The Bureau would then bring in employees at a much lower grade. GS-5 is what our correctional officers start at, GS-6. Yeah. And so on a score, I'm not convinced that we would blow up any budget. All right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Ms. Bartz, I want to ask you, 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 know, you described your situation extremely uh, well. Uh, how many people do you think, I'm way over my time, by the way, but... Uh, um, how many people are in your situation? How many people? Do you think? Well, I would say just from the people I know that I worked with, about, about 250. Just for, that I know of the people that I worked with that, all those years. Yeah. And is that, is that a national population or is that just? No, that's just the Philadelphia Service Center, the people that I know personally. Yeah. Maybe President Kelly, maybe you're the person I should be asking about this. How many folks do you know that are in um, Ms. Ms. Bart's uh, circumstance? Actually, I don't have any. I was, I was um, not surprised, but when I read Ms. Bart's testimony this morning was the first that I knew okay. that um, she, you know, that she or others were facing that problem. That's it's not anything that I have any data on. Okay. Because I think, you know, you've got fairly discreet. Uh, circumstances there that, uh, that that might be addressed if the population were small enough. If it's a big situation, then well, obviously there were, there were ter- ten service centers, so I don't know yeah. how many people would be involved. Okay, I've abused my time. Uh, I'm going to yield. Uh, actually, oh no, I'm not going to yield. Uh, 
Well, I, I think you have all suffered enough. Uh, I appreciate all the testimony you've offered to us today. Uh, I'm going to leave the record open, as we indicated at the beginning of the hearing, for three days in case other members have some questions. I know that Mr. Conley of Virginia has some questions, but not for this panel. Uh, and so I'll leave the record open to allow them to submit written, written testimony. I want to thank you each for your work on behalf of uh, federal employees. I want to thank you for coming forward uh, before this committee and offering your testimony to help us with our work. This is a complicated uh, situation, but I'll, I'll make a commitment that we will work with you to try to figure out how, how to get at these, uh, these inequities that are obviously out there and, uh, and also try to diminish them going forward so that we don't have these big gaps in time where we have these temporary employees out there, that we, we build a system that credits, credits temporary employees so they can use that, they can use that time to get into career positions so that we don't have this big delta between uh, the time they begin as a temporary employee and the time they get on as, as career employees. Uh, and also, uh, a way to recognize the value of that service in the hiring process so that it's a, uh, it, it's a priority and it's, and it's recognized as valuable service. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's astounding that we recognize priorities for different reasons, but time in the job, you know, active, relevant, uh, excellent service in the job is, is, is ignored. Are, uh, are, are sidestepped and instead we treat people as if they're just walking in the door uh, uh, and have never worked in the job before. So I uh, thank you for your, uh, your willingness to testify and to help the, the committee with its work. I wish you all a good day. Thank you. This meeting is now adjourned.